Hmm? We don't need this to uh, turn off the air conditioning because of this new piece of technology we have. So um, we'd like to start with a bow here. It's less, I think, an act of piety than it is a, a wake up. And uh, my name is John Baker, and welcome to New York Buddha Dharma. Um, let's see. So I'm just going to go through the basic points of um, meditation technique. The, um, we're talking about sitting meditation. Of course, one can meditate throughout one's day. And really, the main point of meditation is to come back to the present moment in whatever way uh, we can. And when we sit, we use an object of meditation to bring us back um, from dreams into the present. But one can do it throughout the day as well. So there are basically two modalities for, sit for meditation on the cushion, sitting meditation, and <laughs> what strangely in the uh, Tibetan tradition is called post-meditation practice, as though it were after you meditated, but it's not really. It just means meditating during your daily life. And in fact, that's very powerful uh, and an important way to practice. It's really even more powerful than sitting, although sitting is very, very helpful. It's just that it's harder to practice during one's daily life because we have so many triggers that set us off into dream, into thought. As we walk down the street, you see somebody who reminds you of somebody you knew, and your mind immediately you know, goes to there and creates a story and whatever happens. So it's a little bit easier to come back and stay back in the present on the cushion. So it's an excellent exercise. So we, there are three parts to the instruction. Um, one has to do with how you dispose of your body. Um, the second has to do with working with the object of meditation, which uh, in the most fundamental kind of practice is the breath. And, uh, and also, you might say, space, the space of the present moment, of now. We're going to work with both. And then the third point how, is how one works with mental events, thoughts, and emotions that arise. So let's talk about posture uh, first. Um, it's important to be comfortable and not in pain. Um, if you are in pain, sometimes it's interesting to experiment with it for a little while to see if it's a mental trick. Uh, sometimes our body likes to play tricks on us looking for some kind of uh, diversion. But not for too long, because this isn't an exercise in heroism. That just complicates the matter. Really what this is about is working with our minds. So um, the fundamental posture is to sit either on a cushion, as everybody here is doing except me and Courtney, uh, or to sit in a chair. And uh, it's preferred to sit on a cushion, but sometimes we have physical issues uh, that dictate sitting in a chair. And that's OK, too. And the most important uh, part of sitting is to have a straight back. Weasel, we like to say a hard back, soft front, meaning kind of if you were to drop a plumb line uh, from your fontanelle up here at the top of your head, down through your coccyx, it would be straight. And the reason for that is that when you have a straight back, your breathing comes very naturally. And you're also very alert. It helps you stay awake a bit. Uh, and uh, the energy flows very freely through your body. Now, there are a number of ways to dispose of the legs. Uh, one can sit cross-legged, as Joe is doing. One can kneel. I don't know your name. One way. One way. One way. One wet. 
I'm sorry, I can't. I'm a little hard. When when? When when? Nice to meet you. And you can sit with your legs folded under you, like as when when is doing, or in cross-legged. Uh, sometimes people sit in sort of American Indian style cross-legged posture, or this is what's called the only name I know for this posture that Tim and Michael are both doing is Zen novice posture, with your shins flat on the floor. And the main point of posture, if you're sitting cross-legged, is that your knees um, be no higher than your hips. And if they are, then the cure for that is to put another cushion under your bottom. And the reason for that is just simple. It's just that if your knees are too high, you feel like you're falling back and it creates uh, tension. So you can just experiment with that. The hands, there are various ways of doing this. Uh, the basic way that we do in the Tibetan tradition is just simply resting the palms on the thighs the way Carrie is doing over there, and uh, Michael and Courtney. Uh, although there are other positions that are, have meaning to the mudras, this is the offering mudra, uh, or sometimes called the begging bull mudra, and there are others as well. But the main point is to do what's comfortable and not to get caught up in the meaning of any particular uh, posture because it just adds another level of complication to working with your mind. Um, your arms are relaxed, your shoulders are relaxed. You can start out, oftentimes it's interesting to start out one's meditation practice doing a body scan from your toes right up to the top of your head and down to the tips of your fingers. Just making sure everything is sort of properly disposed of and relaxed. Your eyes uh, in this tradition are open and um, directed down at the ground at about a 45 degree angle. Your gaze is relaxed. Um, doesn't mean swimmy. Uh, it doesn't, you don't go blurry or anything, but it's just not focused. Uh, you know, you're not bearing down on anything in particular, just a very relaxed gaze, unselfconscious. Sometimes people ask if they can close their eyes. And here are the considerations. Uh, it makes you more susceptible to drowsiness. And also by practicing with your eyes open, you're working on uh, developing awareness in the present moment that you can then take off the cushion and uh, walk down the street with. And which is really what our goal is, is to become very awake uh, people. So working with the eyes open um, is a step already in that direction. We're not controlling our breathing, and breathing is natural and shallow. And if you've just climbed a set of stairs, it might be rapid and deep. It doesn't matter. You just let it be natural, whatever it might be. If you're sitting in a chair, um, the important thing is to have your feet flat on the floor. And if they're not, then you put a cushion under them so that your, your soles are flat. Again, um, if you're sitting in a chair, the point is to have a straight back if you can, which is very hard to do sitting in a chair. There is an aid that you can employ. You can go on the internet and buy a special wedge-shaped cushion uh, that's meant for this. It's about three inches wide in the back and about an inch wide in the front or even less. And it tilts your pelvis forward a little bit so that you can sit with an erect spine without using the back of the chair. But if we're sitting in chairs without that cushion, you're probably going to need to use the back because it creates too much strain to try and do it without. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name lady on the floor. Well, in any event, you can do that. Uh, it just makes you more susceptible to falling asleep. Ultimately, uh, one practices anywhere. That's great practice. Any questions about posture? Okay. Comments? Com yes, Carrie. Move, thank you. He's, I think you're being a shill. <laughs> I think he knows the answer to that. 
Yes, it is okay to move, especially uh, if uh, your leg goes to sleep, readjust your legs. Um, you can, uh, if you get tired of sitting cross-legged, bring your knees up. Could you demonstrate like this? And again, you, you want to sort of keep an erect back um, because it's sort of an alert. We call this warrior's posture, actually. Uh, warrior, not in the sense of being aggressive, but in the sense of being ready for anything. And um, you don't want to slump is the main thing and bend, bend your head down. And that's fine. So yes, move. Again, um, sometimes your body plays tricks on you and you can experiment with that, but this is not meant to be an exercise in heroism, which just complicates uh, the sitting practice and you know, turns you into a hero. So, the classic object of meditation in the Buddhist tradition is the breath. And in uh, particular, we're working uh, in here with a, uh, a sort of a, a little slightly more advanced version, which uh, the teacher of some of the people in this room felt was appropriate for Americans, which is uh, working with the out breath. So let's just do this. I'm going to guide you. So with your eyes open and directed down at the ground, gaze natural, you work with the breath going out. And it goes out into the space around us. Our awareness is here in this space. You're aware of the floor and cushions and the sound of my voice and all of that. Whatever your feel of your body, just this easy open awareness of whatever is presenting itself to you. And the breath goes out in the middle of that, like a line. And it goes out and it dissolves into the space. And you're aware of the feeling of the breath as it comes up, exits your nostrils, and goes out into the space and dissolves. And when it dissolves, there's just a gap, nothing for you to do. So the breath comes up, goes out, dissolves, gap. The breath comes up, exits your nostrils, goes out into the space like a line, and dissolves, and there's a gap. And the breath comes up, goes out, dissolves, gap. So let's just do that for a minute or two. So the breath comes up in the middle of the space, goes out into the space like a line, dissolves, and then gap. And the breath comes up. You can feel it as it exits your nostrils, goes out into the space, dissolves, and here you are. Breath comes up. You can feel it exiting your nose goes out into space like a line drawn on water and dissolves, and here you are.
any comments or questions at this point. I like this analogy of the breath going out like a line drawn on water. You know how if you take your finger and you draw a line on the surface of the water and you see it for an instant and then it dissolves and the surface of the water heals over and it's gone. And it's the same with the breath. The breath goes out into the space like a line, into the space that we're sitting here in the middle of and dissolves and there's like just a gap, nothing to do. And then the breath goes out like a line, dissolves, and then open space full of whatever is presenting itself to you. Okay, so <clears throat> last point has to do with working with thought. Um, thought includes uh, discursive thought like words, what's for lunch. It also includes any mental event, so uh, shifting of your attention or the arising of an emotion, a feeling of anger or jealousy or whatever it might arise, although those emotions are usually accompanied by words as well, but they have feelings uh, attached to them, and those are all subsumed under the word thought, mental events that come up and distract us. And basically, there are three kinds of thoughts. There are the very big ones, there are medium-sized ones, <laughs> and there are little ones. And the big ones take you completely away. And after some period of time, it might be the whole meditation period even, you realize that you were lost in a very big dream. Uh, and you were doing something, starting a business, uh, having a relationship with someone in Tallahassee or San Francisco or whatever you were doing. And ding, the, the gong goes off at the end and suddenly you're back. And that's possible. Um, the second kind of thought is a big thought that takes you away, but not for very long. And whenever you have either of those two, as you come back, as you realize that you were thinking, you can just say thinking to yourself and you can observe the thought, see it clearly, what kind of thought it was, how, a particular repetition of a style of thinking that you have and then you let it go. And when you let it go, it just goes. Uh, if you don't follow it, they say in the texts, it self-liberates. Uh, it just goes poof. And um, I think of it uh, like I have a Mac computer and, uh, and you have a dock where you have all these icons that you click on to open different programs. And if you don't want an icon in your dock anymore, it's at the bottom or side of the screen, you take your mouse and you click on that icon, you know, maybe it's W for Word, and you drag it into the middle of the desktop with your mouse, and you let go, and it goes poof, like this, into a little cloud. You get a little picture of a cloud uh, on the desktop. And it's just that way with thought. What you're doing is you're dragging your thoughts into awareness. You know, you weren't aware that you were thinking, and now you are, and then you let go, and they just go poof, like that. Uh, Pema Chudran says that when they dissolve, it's like touching a bubble with a feather. They just pop, you know? It's that, that easy and slight. So we bring awareness to our thoughts, and we let them go. The, and as you do it, you say, thinking, if it's a big thought, like you've been lost for the last 20 minutes, or if it's a medium-sized thought, like you were just, you had a string of thoughts about somebody and then you realized you were thinking, and uh, maybe it was only a minute or so, and you say thinking and you come back. And then there are the very small thoughts, and you can have those while you're still aware of the breath, and you don't have to do anything with them, you just let them go and come back to the breath. Now the main point 
of working with the thoughts, and here's the real trick, is not to beat yourself up at all about having thoughts. In fact, you can make thoughts an object of meditation by simply bringing awareness to the thought that you have, just like you do to the breath, just like you do to the breath, as non-judgmentally as you would to the breath. You're not judging the breath. Oh, that was a good breath. You're not saying that. That was a bad breath. Nobody does that. You know, oh, I shouldn't be breathing. You don't say that. Um, same thing with thinking. You just bring awareness to it, let it go, and then come back to the present moment. And we use the breath as sort of a handle for pulling ourselves back to the present because that's where the breath always is, in the present. So the big trick about working with thought, more and more emotions, is not to judge yourself, first of all, for having them, and second of all, for what kind they were. So there are no holy thoughts, there are no profane thoughts, there are no evil thoughts, there are no disgusting thoughts, there are no brilliant thoughts. They are all just thoughts, all of them. They're stuff. And you see them, you either label them thinking, or if they're really small ones, you don't. And you let them go, and they go poof, and you come back to the breath. Although you can, in that moment of awareness, the breath, the thought has become your object of awareness. And that is terrific practice when you start to do that. You can do it in daily life, too. So any questions about that? working with mental events, thoughts, emotions, mental hiccups of all kinds. Rochelle. Well, our allegiance is to come back, whether it's to the breath or to thinking. And that doesn't mean you follow the thought, but to be aware of the thought. When you're not aware of it, you're just lost in it. You're thinking, 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 you know, you're going somewhere, you're having a fight. As soon as you're aware of it, it's stopped. And you can then let it go, go poof. So the awareness, the allegiance really is to awareness. And you can uh, make thinking the object of your awareness too, and your emotions. Okay, so with that in mind, we're going to practice for about, I think, uh, 10 or 15 minutes, and then discuss it a little bit.